Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Take a Stand with Tracy Wilson. I'm just going to pop on here and mute this so that I can make sure that you guys can actually hear me and see me loud and clear. We're getting a bit, a little bit of feedback this morning on this live show, as sometimes we do. So I just wanted to come on really quickly and tell you guys what's in store for you on today's uh, episode of Take a Stand. Today I'm joined by the amazing Laurie Lynn and I want to share with you her journey, the journey of how she became, I'm going to say, happily and unemployable. So after being told by her ex-husband uh, that many that any attempts that she is going to have as far as like trying to build a business or generate any type of income were absolutely laughable at best. She's actually gone on to found a book editing business and she's grown it to, to over six figures in just 12 months whilst also homeschooling her three kids during a global pandemic. So I know that you guys are going to want to watch and you're going to want to listen to Laurie's journey because there will be so many gems inside of this that uh, if you listen really, really carefully, you too can go on to being happily unemployable. So hang around because we're going to be talking all things happily unemployable in just a few moments. We'll be back in just a minute. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Take a Stand show. This is the show where we share inspirational, motivational stories from women who have overcome adversity, beaten the odds to go on to build success in their business, their family, and their lives. So if you're a woman who is wanting to do that, then you want to hang around and you want to be a listener of the Take a Stand show. Today's guest, I am so excited to bring her onto the screen in just a moment because she is full of energy, vivacious, so inspiring. I want to introduce you guys to her now. So welcome to the show, Lori Lynn. And let me unmute her so you can actually talk for a moment. Hello and welcome. Thank you, Tracy. So excited to be on your show. I can't even begin to tell you how thrilled I am to be on the show with the co-author of The She-Myth. Well, thank you so much. And we're so excited that um, I was telling Laurie Lynn that before... Uh, you know, creating the show, uh, the book, The she -Myth, was kind of like the inspiration be behind uh, creating the actual show that goes with this book. So for those of you who haven't got yourself uh, a copy of The she -Myth book, Laurie may, uh, may well talk about the book and, and maybe some of the impacts that she's uh, had as a result of reading it um, throughout today's show. We're going to try this a little bit differently, guys, just so that you know, live show here today. Um, we're getting a little bit of feedback. So we're going to do, I'm going to try and do my best to control the audio. And when I'm speaking, Laurie will be, uh, she'll be muted and vice versa. So I'm going to unmute her now and I'm going to mute me. But before I do, I want to ask her some questions, right? So I want to know, about Laurie, what was the background? And like back, way back when, Laurie, when you were, you know, you were in a stable job and kind of life was so different to what you've got right now. I want to know kind of like what was the catalyst for this massive change that you had? What was the adversity that you overcame? And how did that kind of like take us on a journey as to how that all unfolded? Absolutely. So before I got married back, you know, 1999, um, I was working full time. And when I got married, we decided mutually that I would work part time, he would work full time. And then if and when we ever had children, we wouldn't feel the impact of the income, you know, having to pay for childcare or having, you know, a dual income family reducing to one for a period of time or whatever. So, um, I ended up homeschooling three children and essentially being a stay at home mom for, you know, 15 years. Um, and then I went through a divorce and all of a sudden I had to take those 15 years of stay at home mom parenting and translate that into the workforce. And I had friends telling me like, you're going to have to get a job. And I'm like, I'm going to have to get a business. <laughs> 
I still want to homeschool. I still want to run my kids to acting gigs. I still want to be there and be present for them. I don't want to have to work a standard 40 hour a week job. I want to be able to work on my terms. And so um, interestingly enough, as I was going through my divorce, my ex-husband had the gall to say any attempts that you might make at generating income are laughable at best. And I was like, Okay, well, we'll see about that. <laughs> and then fast forward a couple of years. And in 2020, I built from the ground up from zero to six figures, a book editing business that now employs not only myself, but also other women who are in challenging situations, who are divorced and trying to raise kids or who are on the autism spectrum and, you know, don't want to work in a traditional environment. And um, so, yeah, I was like, you must not know about me. <laughs> Absolutely love that, Laurie. And and like, you know, one of the things that I want to know, I love the fact that you've kind of found your thing. You said, do you know what? Even though you've said that, oh, you must not know about me because you wait. You know, you've been married to me for how long? And you still don't know that I've got the, you know, the um, tenacity and the drive to actually create this. You just stand back, honey, and you just watch me go. And, and obviously you have just gone, gone, gone. But the fact that you've got really connected that, that your experience, your journey with how you, um, you know, stay at home mom, uh, homeschooling kids, hugely busy. And, you know, I can only imagine um, what that's like to have to homeschool three kids and kind of try and keep everything in check. And then go, do you know what? The, my life now, as I knew it, has been tipped upside down because the way in which we were we set out to create this was that. The, my husband was going to be the breadwinner. I was going to do all the things behind the scene because that was kind of the way that it was supposed to go. And so that world that you were that you had created was completely thrust upside down and going, what am I going to do now? And then having your friends say, well, the way that you need to go, go get a job because that, that's what normal normal people would do and you're going actually no because I realize what I need to continue to do in my in my life I actually have to create a business that is uh that is going to support the life that I want not the other way around so I absolutely love that I love the fact that you're now supporting women so I want to know um in terms of like creating that how did you go about like stay at home mom completely got so many skills, particularly because you're schooling children from home, right? Like picking up so many different skills. How did you end up being in the book editing space? Like how did that come about? Well, I actually started editing books back when my oldest was a toddler. He's now 17 years old, but I just did it for friends, you know, friends who wanted to write books, who needed someone to read them and just make sure that they flowed and they sounded good. Um, and then they would pitch them to, you know, maybe a publisher or an editor. And again and again, what I heard was this is the cleanest manuscript we've ever had. Um, this is actually really well written. Or um, I have another, I have a one of my very best friends in the world. She's a Jane Austen fan fiction novelist. And mm -hmm. she sees all of her um, other authors in her space get torn apart. Their reviews are just brutal because they're self-publishing and they're Americans writing this, you know, British literature, at least, you know, sort of inspired by. And her, the books that I had spent some time in that I had edited got rave reviews from these, you know, British critics. And she's mm -hmm. like, you're actually really good at this. Like, this is something that you should do full time. Um, and I just didn't think that I could make any money at it, you know? And then it wasn't until I started my own podcast that my podcast coach said, hey guys, Dan Henry just wrote his first mm -hmm. book. And he normally doesn't do interviews, but he's willing to do them to help promote his book you should go get them on your show. So I reached out to Dan Henry and said, hey, congratulations. I'm writing your first book as a book editor. I know what a grueling process it can be. Um, would love to have you on my show. And he goes, oh, wait, you're a book editor? I need to hire you. And I'm like, yes, you do. And here's why. And once I edited that book and we knocked it out in, you know, record time. Um, and I was really meticulous. He says I cared more about his project than he cared about 
his project and he had never worked with anyone who had that level of intensity, you know, like it is going to be great. <laughs> Just, you know, put the brakes on, put your seatbelt on, we gotta go. Um, then he started putting me in front of his high level mastermind students and said, mm -hmm. look, every one of you needs to write a book. And if you want it to be as good as mine, you need to hire Lori and you need to give her a deposit right now. And in 15 minutes, I made $15,000 with his recommendation. Yeah, wow. Well, I'm just want to say, I, I want to sort of turn around because uh, that book that you speak of is actually on the shelf just ah! over there. I actually have a copy of that. I have a copy of that book. I could get up and walk over there and pull it off the shelf. I absolutely do. I'll show it to you after, um, after the show. But congratulations to you. I mean, the thing, um, our audio is uh, it's still, I don't know if you guys can hear this. Can somebody let me know if you guys can hear that feedback? Because I'm going to go back to like muting the two of us in just a second. I just want to make sure that you can hear everything we're saying. Let me know if it's okay. Yeah, here we go. Okay, so because one of the things I think we've done particularly well then is like putting yourself out there. Like so, being a being a. Um, I'm going to mute. One minute. So being, you know. Yeah, yeah, audio is off. Yeah, thanks, Cassie. I thought it was too. I can hear a delay. So I've, I'm going to fix that by um, by muting the two of us. So one of the things that obviously you did, because you did all of this like smack bang in the middle of a global pandemic. And most people would think, oh, well, Laurie, you know, wh what are you doing? You're going to try and start a business in the middle of a global pandemic? Like, I want to know from you, like you say that was kind of like, one of the the blessings was the pandemic for you because for what for whatever reason which we'll get to was actually a um, a big blessing for you and then the fact that you 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 I want to talk about visibility because I'm hearing from you you started a podcast and I want to know in this process of you kind of building yourself up creating your own business what do you think was like the number one thing that shifted you from being stay home mom homeschooling got some skills to uh to now kind of been you know blowing up and having uh the opportunity to work with some you know really solid people that could open doors for you really really quickly like how did that um how did that all come about and why did that happen like what was the thing <laughs> Tracy muted herself before she finished her question. <laughs> so what was the what was the catalyst from uh, going from stay at home mom full time to full time business owner? And honestly, I think that for me, it was a slow build. Um, I can look back at my yellow brick road and I can say, you know, I tried network marketing when I was a full time mom. And when I was doing that, um, one of the mentors that I had recommended the book, uh, Bob Proctor's uh, It's Not About the Money. And I listened to that book again and again and again. And then Bob Proctor told me via email about um, an, an SEO group that was teaching a way to make money online. And he highly recommended them. So I check out um, OMG and I start to try to learn SEO. And it's like, they're speaking Russian and I don't speak Russian, you know, and I just tried so hard to learn it. But then they had a live event in Nashville and I live in Nashville. So I thought oh, I'll attend the live event. So I attended the live event, got introduced to Myron Golden and Kevin David. And I started learning um, some Facebook advertising tactics from and uh, digital course stuff from Kevin David started really following Myron Golden and listening to Myron Golden's podcast. Well, then I find out they're both going to be at Funnel Hacking Live and Myron Golden's mentor is Russell Brunson. So when when someone I'm following says I follow this person, I follow that person too. Like I want to go where the gold is. So I start following Russell Brunson and I start listening to his uh, like the marketing in your car original podcast that he was doing. Um, and started, you know, really gleaning from him in terms of business. So attended Funnel Hacking Live and it was there that I decided to go all in on uh, their coaching program. That's where I met Jamie Atkinson, who was my podcast coach. And I just had this burning desire to give back. Um, I was at the lowest point in my life as I was coming out of um, my 
very dead marriage into this new life of being divorced. And the, listening to podcasts is what kept me, and, and you ask what this, what is the one thing? I would say the one thing that kept my head above water, that kept me from feeling like I was drowning, that kept me from feeling overwhelmed and frustrated and alone was listening to podcasts. I would listen everywhere I went. I would listen in the car. I would listen while I was doing dishes. I would listen while I was packing. I would listen while I was doing laundry. I was constantly filling my head with positivity and, and business owners and their strategies and tactics. And so I wanted to provide a way for women in my situation to know that there are other ways of generating income. You don't have to do the traditional track. So my podcast is all about taking the road less traveled. And so when I get an, an opportunity to do an interview like this, I'm all in. I'm like, the, God only knows, like who needs this? Like who's listening right now who just needs Need somebody to go hang in there you can do it it's totally worth it i know it's hard but you can totally do this like i've got you you know what i mean so i love that you wrote the book that your your podcast is take a stand that you're doing exactly the the catalyst for what got me out of you know what looked like dismal you know i'm about to drown to oh no i can fly <laughs> this is great you know what i mean Absolutely. I know exactly what you mean. And what's really interesting with this is like, that really speaks to a lot of women, right, who are like, um, struggling with whatever it is that you you're struggling with, knowing that you can reach out to someone even just putting, you know, that headset on and listening to filling your brain and filling your mind with really positive, really fulfilling things enables you to kind of make that shift and enables you to see, Oh, it's the, it, it opens your eyes up to the possibilities that are available. And I love the fact that you've, you know, watching, and this is something that I, that, um, I talk about a lot, particularly inside of our, our coaching programs, is you want to watch what is it that people are doing? Like, what are they actually doing? Like, that's a, that's a fundamental key. It's not just listening to what they're telling you to do, but study them. Like you said, look, I'm, I've started to study and follow these people and get into their worlds, the Myron Goldens, the Kevin Davids, uh, you know, all of the, the Russell Brunsons, and studying what is it that they're doing and going all in, like saying, I'm going to back myself. I don't care what you, you know, what you ex-husband said. You know, it might be laughable, but I'll, I'll have the last laugh. You watch me and diving deep in and just getting stuck into it and not holding anything back. And I think often, um, I want to talk about go down this path too, Laurie, because there's a lot of women out there that are actually afraid and frightened to even speak, speak about what they do or speak their truth. And sometimes it can be quite scary to get on a platform like this where you're like, it's live. Like we cannot, we don't edit this. What we say is what we say, right? It's it's full on. You're getting the full version of me and the full version of you. No edits in this. Um, so that can be scary in itself. And the same with podcasting. People get afraid of doing, afraid of actually stepping out and putting themselves out there. What would you say to women who have something to share and they want to do it what would you say to them how would you Tra i feel like tracy is muting herself before she finishes her, <laughs> her question by accident what would i say to women um i would i would say the three tenets that you have about this program this take a stand is, is stand up stand firm and stand out because when you stand up, you're you're a target. You you just are. Like I don't care who you are or what you're doing. The moment you stand up, you're a target. And then when you stand up, you better just lock those legs, baby. <laughs> just stand firm because they're gonna come at you. The haters will come at you. They will. It may take a while. Like I had my first hater this week, like blatant hater on Facebook this week. And I was thinking for years, I was like, oh, I'll never have haters. I love everybody. I'm so happy. And then someone didn't like the way that I um, gave feedback about a book. I actually said, you need to read it out loud. And they were like, that's too much. <laughs> so when you stand up, 
automatically you stand out. And um, when you're standing firm, you don't have to worry about what the haters are saying because as people are watching, they see that you have taken a stand, you've planted yourself on that truth and you're not about to budge. So I don't care what that person said about me. All I know is my job is to make online influencers look as smart on the page as they sound from the stage. And that means I take their work and I read it over and over and over and I make them read it out loud at least once because if they're going to turn it into an audiobook, they have to read it out loud at some point. And I don't want them calling me when they're reading the audiobook going, you didn't catch this and this doesn't make sense to me. And I'm like, mm -mm, no, we're going to cut that off, you know, at the front end and just know that when you dive into that book, you don't have a reason to get tripped up, which also means your audience doesn't have a reason to get tripped up. And we want to, at all times, honor the audience. So when you're not thinking about yourself, when you have them in mind and you know that you're coming to the table with something to offer, something that's going to stimulate their emotions and their intellect, then you don't have to worry about uh fear of what other people say or do because you know that your heart's in the right place and you're taking care of your people. So you just lead with taking care of your people and stand up, stand firm and stand up. Oh, preach girl. That's exactly what you're, 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 in, you're on the right show, right? It, 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 God, this, this silly, crazy audio today. So you're absolutely right. It is like once you get that and you get a hater, it, you kind of like you created a shield you've created your your insulation between yourself and that hater it doesn't matter anymore because you know exactly what it is that you stand for you're prepared to stand up stand firm and now you're going for it and you're starting to stand out and i guarantee if even though you've got one hater you will have you know thousands and thousands of of you know lovers and that's that's the the um the beautiful thing about about doing this and like you say if you can put the audience that you're you're speaking to and them at the forefront of your mind and that's what you're doing with intention then it doesn't matter i mean I, i'm loving what you're talking about here i want to go down this path too as uh, you talk about like building the journey to becoming happily unemployed right and that whole concept of that and why working yourself out of a job as a parent will actually preserve your sanity. So let's talk about that and how that's created or how you create your sanity. I'm going to pause for a moment because I know we've got a lag so that we get all of what I'm saying. Good job, Tracy. <laughs> that was awesome. Yes, I am a huge advocate of as a parent, your job is to work yourself out of a job. That's it. Like you want to raise independent humans who are responsible, who you like to be around so that other people will like to be around them. And so my 10 year old makes lunch. Yesterday, while I was with my 10 year old, my 14 year old was baking a cake. So when I hear parents saying, you know, I don't know what I'm going to make for dinner. I'm like, I don't know what my 10 year old's making for dinner. You know what I mean? Like I can't, I'm, I can't do it all. And I won't. I will not do it all. This We are a team. We all live in the house. I'm not paying for chores. No one pays me to do chores. Now, if there's something that I'm willing to pay for, you know, like something extra, then I'll, I'll, shell, I'll shell out a little extra money. You know what I mean? But when it comes to just basic maintenance of the house, like I expect my kids to pick up after themselves and they can keep their rooms any way they want. And I can keep my room any way I want. But this public area, like, if I am going to be like, I have, um, my kids are at their dad's every weekend. So I work like a machine all weekend. I want this space to be peaceful and I want harmony and I want quiet and I don't want to trip over their stuff. So every Thursday night, I'm like, all right, look around and you tell me if I'm going to enjoy being in the space while you're gone. And then they look at it through my eyes and like, oh, sorry, mom, I got it. You know, I got to get this. I got to get that. So it's all about giving them the mindset. Again, it all goes back to your audience. It's like, look at your space with someone else's eyes. Is it inviting? You know, is someone walking in going to trip and, and hurt themselves over your stuff? Or did you clear a nice path? Is it inviting? Um, does it feel chaotic? Does it feel warm and welcoming? And just constantly ask those questions and make it, um, make the space that you live in 
the kind of space that you would want to invite someone else into and let them own it. Just let them own it. And then you have essentially worked yourself out of a job so that you can do all of the stuff that you want to do and take them on the trips that you want to take them on or, you know, go roller skating in the middle of the, of the afternoon or, you know, the fun things that would be wonderful if you could do them. Just set it up so that um, in, at the end of the day, you can actually be jealous of your own life. That my goal is to create a life that if it were not my life, I would be jealous of my own life. And unmute and mute. There we go. And I, that is awesome. I would love, you know, when you look back, you take that kind of like step back, look at your life from a, from a very different point of view, but do that not only with your own life, but also give other people that opportunity to do exactly the same. I love how you've, um, you're very much in alignment with the kind of stuff that I do with my kids too, and did, they're much, much older now, they're all adults themselves and starting to have their own children and starting to do the same sorts of things. But I know that, you know, with you doing that and you instilling those um, th those really strong uh, foundations, beliefs and rituals into your children, you've learned them from somewhere. And I know you've got some stories or some things that you've learned from your 90 year old grandmother. And I want to know, you know, what you talk specifically about the lessons that you learned from her through the experience that she had through the Great Depression. And I want to know what are those experiences and how have you taken that your, your grandmother's history, her story, and how has that played out in your life? Make sure I'm not muted. <laughs> so I have had the privilege and the honor of spending the last few months with my 90 year old grandma. She was born in 1930, um, one of 11 children, first girl in 11 children. And she tells stories of when she was four years old, she had to take turns with her siblings fanning the flies off of her mother when her mother um, had uh, not scarlet fever. Oh, what was it? Um, I'll think of it in a minute. But they thought she was going to die. The, everyone around them, they were just they were not surviving this fever. And so um just thinking about her and how they didn't have running water, they didn't have electricity, they didn't even have screens on the windows. So as a four-year-old, she's taking her turn, spending 30 minutes standing over her mother, fanning those flies off of her, just like watching for a little flicker of an eyelash, hoping that her mother is breathing and knowing that we don't have to do anything like that. You know, it can be really hard. Some days are really hard, but they're never that hard. Um, I lived in Uganda, East Africa for six months. We didn't have running water. We didn't have, um, we had to, you know, go to the pit latrine outside. That's the way my grandma grew up. So I got a little taste of what it was like. And the fact that I actually have clean running water in my house and my kids don't have to walk miles to go get it and potentially get abused, um, you know, come back exhausted, get sick, um, get bitten by mosquitoes and get malaria. You know, there are so many things that we don't have to deal with. So I'm constantly putting myself in this frame of mind that, you know, I have this beautiful 90 year old example of someone who has weathered every possible storm imaginable in um, in our country and then having lived in a third world country and getting just a taste of what she experienced growing up and just recognizing that um, the biggest thing that I can do every single day is be grateful. And it's interesting. This morning, my 14 year old said, you know, mom. I think I'm going to be um, amazing at adulting because of the way you raised me. And I said, well, can you give me an example of what you're talking about? And she gave me a couple of like life hacks, you know, that I've given her. And she said, but I think the biggest thing that you've done is ever since I was five years old, you had us say three things at the end of every day when we were doing our bedtime prayers that we were grateful for. We would do our thankfuls and they would come up with three things from the day that they were thankful for. She said, I am grateful all the time. I'm the most grateful person I know. I look around and everyone is so ungrateful, but I am so grateful because you instilled in me to look for throughout the day. What are the things I'm grateful for? Because I'm going to have to tell you at the end of the day, my three things. And 
well, I read just this morning again, it, it ha like there's this um, compounding effect. Alex Sharfin um, in his email today, it was all about gratitude. And he and his wife, Katie, they do the same thing with their girls at the end of the day. Three things. What are the three things you're grateful for? It revolutionizes your experience. And when you can look at your experience compared to that of someone who has weathered the Great Depression, it, it's transformative. Like the things that you think are hard are like, oh, well, okay. Okay, it's not that hard. <laughs> well, it, it gives you some, like, it gives you perspective. It gives you um, something to compare with, right? Like you're going back, looking at how your grandma had to, to um, you know, the life that she lived and the, the storms that she weathered, and she's still here. And then putting that, uh, you know, having that ritual of what am I grateful for, like, thinking about those is that old adage of like what you focus on so as your children are going through the day like you were saying they're looking for things well I'm grateful that I can be on you know I, I have the technology to be able to be on here with somebody who's in a completely different country to me and I can connect with all these amazing women you know you're, you're actually focused and you're looking for those specific things so giving your day intention and that then also being able to reflect on that like you like you're talking about like um stacking gratitude stacking of i'm grateful for this and i'm grateful for that and i'm grateful for that and i'm grateful for that and then all of a sudden like your daughter says i'm like look around i'm like the most grateful person i know uh and then you know that being creating joy and happiness and it's no there is no mistake here or no mistaking that you obviously do that because that is oozing from every like every part of your being, even being on the show, seeing you, you we can feel that energy and the, the amount of gratitude that you have and that you're actually a really happy person. So would you say that's like kind of like the number one hack that you would you would have taught the children? Or is there like give us maybe two two others because I think there's like a whole vault of uh lorry hacks that we we need to kind of start uncovering now. You've opened a can of worms. You're so cute. Oh my goodness. Um, the Well, people ask me all the time, like, how did you raise such remarkable children? Because they make eye contact, they smile, they carry on conversations, they're confident, they're creative, they're fun. I like to be around them. And I said, I, I have never in my entire adult life owned a television, not a day in my life. And my secret is books. Lots and lots of books, really good books. And I read out loud. I read out loud all the time, every day. And uh, there's a woman named Carol Joy Side who turned me on to the idea of reading out loud to your children and then read until you are they are old enough to have grandchildren and then read to your grandchildren. Never stop reading out loud. So when I'm sitting down to read a book out loud to my 10 year old, my 17 year old son plops down on the couch to listen. And my 14 year old daughter will come in and lean on the wall, you know, and listen like they're a little they're a little cool, you know, to be listening right now. But they're listening. And we have created this magical space where we snuggle and we share stories. And then when we have experiences, we can relate to those experiences through the stories that we've read. You know, for example, um, we were driving through the the woods, we were going up this like windy road and all of a sudden there was ice and snow on the trees and all three of the kids went, oh, mom, it's like Narnia. And all of a sudden we're transported. We're all transported into this world that C.S. Lewis created over a hundred years ago because we read these stories together. And then I have audiobooks playing in the car all the time. So as often as possible, and it's and I definitely have not done this as much in the last two or three years since the divorce. Um, there's one of me, three of them. You know, I have to work and have a business as well as raise children and homeschool. So I haven't been as um, aggressive, I guess, <laughs> around minimizing the screen time. But for the first, you know, decade, decade and a half of raising children there was almost no screen time. It was almost all, you know, real life, experiential learning, having conversations with real people or learning about people and the world that we live in through really good books.
the 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 what I'm hearing with this, and I'm sort of reflecting even on you know my life and what I've done with with my kids, and when I think back to some of the things that I've done over time, particularly, I'm going to say particularly with you know writing the book, doing this show, uh, being very forward about what I believe in, and all of those sorts of things. You know, often we go through, and probably way back when, you know, when you were reading the kids, reading the books to the kids when they were little and you were homeschooling them, you're in the thick of it and you're you're doing the best you can because, you know, that's what we do without necessarily kind of thinking about, I'm doing all of these things with solid intention that I'm going to drill into my children that it's the right thing to do to read a book, et cetera, et cetera. And I remember me doing this, um, like with the kids when they were little. And as they sort of grew up, I'm thinking, like you were saying, you know, the daughter sort of hanging on the, the wall going, you know, I'm listening, but I kind of really don't want to show mum that I'm really interested in listening because that wouldn't be cool. You know, kind of having those experiences with, with them as they, as they kind of matured and got into their teenage years. But then now, like I'm seeing even, um, you know, my sons, you know, really goal, like they're goal setting, they're, they're reading books, they're very, very much into, um, you know, the, their business space, like, how do I do things differently, like really watching what you do. And like we were talking about a little bit earlier about you watching what some of these other influential pe people have been become influential in your life, like watching what it is that you're doing. Your children in the next generations are doing the same thing. They're not necessarily taking in the teachings that you are giving them verbally, but they're very much watching what you do. And then before long, they start to actually emulate that. That's certainly been my experience. And now even with the next generation, so with my granddaughter, and I think back to when I was little, you know, being eight years old, there was no way in heck that you would have seen me standing in front of the classroom delivering any kind of speech I would have been that shy and that scared to do that but yet I've had my granddaughter on the show with me a few times and now she came home a few weeks ago and said Nan I've I've, I've applied for school council and um, I have to do a speech and I've written a speech and I'm going to deliver it on such and such a day and up there she delivers it and uh, she was, you know, she then was the youngest one to be uh, to be asked to to actually make it onto the school council. So this whole process of like watching and really uncovering, like from an adult point of view, taking on some of that, watching what people are doing, studying what they do, then going away and actually doing that, but then replicating that entire process with the next generations. And like you have with your grandmother that storytelling and being able to disseminate that down and instill that, tell the stories yourself, bring them into that world, create a the world of them being able to imagine where they're going to be because that's going to create the, the, the bring the future into the now, starts to really build a solid foundation for the next generation to be able to stand up, stand firm and start standing out in a very unique way. So I love all of that. I want to know, Laurie, because we're, we're, me and you could talk for ages and it's a bit of a shame that our um, audio is just not playing nicely with us today that we have to kind of do this silo thing. But I want to know, like, if there were three things, aside from kind of the, the mantra of what we talk about on the, the Take a Stand show, that you would recommend any woman who is, you know, wanting to really stand out or, or um, you know, def redefine themselves in the world of business, what would be three things that you would advise them to do that they can start doing today? Am I unmuted? <laughs> So the first thing that came to mind, you it was so funny. You held up the book at the, the first time. The first thing I thought was read the she-myth, read the book. I read the introduction to my 14-year-old and she said, oh, they need to get the audiobook done so we can take a road trip and listen to it together. And I told Vicki Helm, I'm like, you need to do the audiobook. And she's like, we're doing it. I'm like, yes. <laughs> so yes, read books like the she-myth. Um, that is probably, you know, listen to podcasts, um, follow women who are strong, who are standing up, who are taking a stand, who are standing firm. Um, find out, you know, how they think about the world. And then the next thing is to be curious. So question everything. So if someone says, oh, you can't do that, just ask, well, why not? 
you know, why, why wouldn't I do that? You know, you can't go, you know, you're going to have to get a job. Well, okay, well, let's just back up for a second. Why would I want to do that? What would that look like? Let me look at the path that um, if I, you know, go down that trajectory, if I take that trajectory and I start walking down that path, is that what I want ultimately? And, and just ask yourself, you know, like, um, when I had my hater this week, I talked to a friend who is an attorney and I said, I, I need some advice. And he said, well, what is it that you want? What do you want out of the situation? And I thought, that's the best question. And it's just such a good question. So when you're faced with what the world says and what the world expects, you can ask, well, what do I want? What do I want? I want to be able to be with my kids all day. I want to be available to them. I want my kids to be able to continue to do acting gigs and go to rehearsal and, um, you know, be expressive and do their thing and have their mom show up at their, their events. Like, that's what I want. So I'm going to build a business around my life instead of getting a job and hoping that my life can fit into those little nooks and crannies that are, you know, available. Um, so first thing is look for models, look for mentors, read the she myth, obviously. And, um, the second thing is be curious, you know, ask questions, you know, who came up with that idea? Like, why is that a good idea? Is that good for me? Is that even what I want? Um, and then the third thing is be kind to yourself. The most impactful book that I read this year was written by, um, Dr. Edith Eva Ager, and she survived Auschwitz. She was like 50 years old when she got her PhD. She was like 90, I think, when she wrote the book, The Gift. Like the woman is just, she is a gift. And this book is a gift. And one of the things that she, as a um, clinical psychologist now, she, she works with people who have some of the most traumatic experiences you could possibly imagine. And she helps them find hope. And one of the things that she said that hit me so hard was um, to look at yourself in the mirror and say to yourself, I love you. I will never leave you. I will always take care of you. And, and it is revolutionary. So be kind to yourself, love yourself, and for you know, goodness sake, read that book. <laughs> Or have the the author, not the author, but the narrator read it to you on Audible, which is what I did. I'm, I'm, I'm on my second time listening to it. But genuinely, like, look at yourself in the mirror and tell yourself, I love you. I will always be here for you. I will take care of you. And be kind. Be kind to yourself. Thanks, Laurie. I love all three of those. And, you know, they are they're different. That's fantastic advice that you're uh, giving other women out there. I mean, obviously, they can go in if they want a copy of the Shemuth book, you can go and get it at the moment. It's like 99 cents on on Amazon. You can get the the uh, the ebook version. And just to your point, you were asking about the audio book. Yes, our audio book is coming out. It's literally just uh, come off of out of uh, out of our speaker's uh, mouth. It's all finished uh, we are just about ready to have that uploaded and make that and to make that available so probably within the next six weeks you'll see that available also in Amazon so for those of you that want a copy of the book go to amazon.com and just uh, look up the she myth and you'll be able to purchase it on there the other things that Laurie obviously spoke about today is just you know also surrounding yourself with other really good people people that can lift you up that can support you that can insulate you from you know whatever trolls haters you know whatever life throws at you create that insulation around you so you've got really good support networks people that can be your cheerleaders and lift you up when you need lifting up and also you know switching off the things that don't serve you and being very very true to who you are and thinking about well what is it that i really want am i doing this because i'm trying to please somebody else or am i doing this because it's actually what makes me happy that is your pathway to creating a success in your life and being happily unemployable and i'm sure that laurie's going to go down you know would say that you know when you are happy and you're you're creating the space of being unemployable because 
why would you want to be employed when you are happily doing it yourself? You're happily have created the business that supports and fuels your life and not the other way around, where you can only be happy in those little nooks and crannies of uh, the in-betweens of the nine to five. So I want to say thank you so much to Laura Lynn for being on the show today. I absolutely love what she's about and love her energy. And I just want to know, I'm going to mute myself in a moment because I know that people are going to want to know how do they connect with Lori? Like where can they go, Lori, in terms of social media? And uh, if they want more of you, what's the best place for them to hang out with you on? And tell us about your podcast too, no doubt. Okay. So if you want to tune into my podcast, it is called Rise and Climb with Lori Lynn. Rise and Climb. And if you're on Facebook, then I have a Facebook group and it's facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash happily unemployable. And we're in there, you know, sharing all kinds of juicy nuggets about how to be happily unemployable. You'll be among people that are your people. And we call it the happily unemployable family. Um, on Facebook, I'm Hey Lori Lynn. So you could find me there. And um, I'm not really on a lot of social channels. I can only keep up with so much. So podcast, Rise and Climb, Facebook group, Happily Unemployable. And I would love to meet you, especially if you're a fan of Tracy Wilson and Vicki Helm. I mean, come on. Does it get any better than this? <laughs> You're just way too kind. Thank you so much for that. Look, I want to say, guys, you want to go and hang out with her. I mean, who wouldn't want to be around that energy, right? So uh, go check Lori Lynn out. I want to say thank you so much to her for being on the show today. Even with our little, you know, we, we, we were trying this little different thing today with having to mute her and I, so a little bit disjointed, so I apologize for that. But um, fantastic to have her here. No doubt we are going to continue to, uh, to have great conversations, and I'd love to know more about what it is that she's up to in the future, and you just never know. We might have her back on the Take a Stand show uh, sometime soon too. And for everybody that's been watching today, thank you so much for being here. Like I said, you can go and get yourself a copy of the uh, She Myth book, and uh, also we've got some great things coming out very, very shortly that is really going to help you to find your place to be able to create visibility so that you too can stand out Create your messaging so you can stand firm and really find your place in this world of business. So keep your eyes and ears tuned for those because I will be sharing them uh, over the coming weeks. And for now, I want to say thank you so much to everyone for watching. We'll be back again next Thursday, Australia, Brisbane time at 10 a.m. for another episode of the Take a Stand show where I'll be having another amazing, inspirational, motivational woman who has overcome adversity to create success across their business, family, and life. So thanks, everybody. I'm going to unmute uh, Laurie because I know she's going to want to say goodbye, and I'm going to say bye for now. Bye. Love you. Mwah. Thanks so much, Laurie. Thank you, right, Trina. Guys. See you guys next week. Bye for now. We did it. Amazing. Well, what's going on with that audio today? Normally it's, it's good as well. So it's just, having a, it's just having a bit of a moment one of them days, but we managed. That's what we, we did, right? We just figured it yep. out on the fly. That was fantastic. Yep. You do what you can with what you have where you are. You got it. I don't know why. Have you and I not connected inside of 2CCX? I don't think so. Have we? And I'm not sure. I'm not sure why, because I was in um, I was in Russell's two uh, CCX program too for a, uh, a couple of well two and a half years, and uh, so all the people you're rattling off, like they're all very very familiar to me. I know them all too. We're all in the same kind of circles. You must know Cassie Brown too, yeah. Yeah, so Cassie's fantastic. So she's also uh, one of the partners in, in a company that uh, that Vicky myself. Uh, Cassie Brown and a couple of other people are, are in too. So I'm so appreciative that you've read the book and that you enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. Well, I actually haven't read the whole thing, um, but my daughter, my 14 year old, and I are going to read it together on a weekend trip. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for that. And thank you for being here. I've really appreciated um, us connecting and I love that conversation. 
Thanks. It was such a joy. I, I was so honored that you guys even thought to ask. So, and your energy is so great. <laughs> so oh, thank great. you. Thank you. I mean, I, you know, this is, it's funny because you talk about like doing the podcast and I went down that path of kind of doing podcasts, but this is kind of like, I found my, you know, my place is, um, is doing these live shows and like out of the live show, it's really interesting because you talk about, oh man, I've got to be on all the different places. We've created like a really um, well-oiled machine where I can take the show now and it becomes the podcast. It becomes, you know, all of my social media materials. So it's, it's kind of been, it's been awesome that we've been able to do that, obviously off the back of a bunch of books and other things that we've been creating too. I love that. I love it. Yeah. But look, let's stay in contact and uh, no doubt I'll see you in, in you know, our group, and I'd love to even be part of your group so I can see what's going on in there and add to the uh, add to the conversation if I can. Yes, yes, please. And I would love to have you on my show too. I, my favorite people to interview are authors, and you're speaking my language. <laughs> well, let's do it. Let's let's make sure we do that. It's um, yeah. You just reach out and let me know, you know, what dates and stuff you've got, and I'll make sure that we find a time in my diary to to make that happen. Awesome. Sounds great. All right. Well, thank you so much. Have a fantastic day. Thank you. You too. All right. See you, Laurie. Bye. Bye.